Okay. G'day world, hello world, everybody. Look, we've we've got uh, Steve Fuller here from Warwick University, and we're going to be talking about Yuval Harari's new upcoming book, Homo Deus, the Future of Humankind. Now, I just might say that I actually did uh, a course early in the day, uh, a few years ago, uh, called A Brief History of Humankind, which was based on uh, his Sapiens book, but actually before it was released in English. And I must say it was a really good book. It was well worth the 20 weeks of my participation in the course there. Now, um, Steve Fuller has had an advanced copy of the book and has been reviewing it, or has done a review and, and, and submitted it online. I've got it on my website, the SciFuture website. So, yeah, how are you doing, Steve? I'm doing fine, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what do you think of the book? I mean, like okay. you've read it? You've, you've, yes, uh, I've, you've digested I've read, I've read. it, and you've... Not only have I reviewed it, I've read it. Um, yes, well, that's a, they're two very different things. I, I did it in the proper order. Um, the, uh, the first thing to say is that... Uh, so this guy, Yuval Harari, uh, is a historian uh, by training, and the book of, that you referred to earlier, Sapiens, um, came out a couple of years ago and was a bestseller worldwide. And So, for example, in the UK, it was actually in the Sunday Times bestseller list. Um, oh, and yes. uh, the, the, the book, uh, he's a professor of history at the University of Tel Aviv in Israel, uh, and, um, and the book, the, the original, the Sapiens book, uh, is a book that covers, uh, let's say, the last um, 75,000 years of human history, where human beings become humans, as we understand it, in terms of, uh, not, not just uh, physiologically, but also in terms of um, social arrangements, culture, mm -hmm. and so forth. And he basically shows how this kind of evolutionary past sort of um, streams through, actually, uh, human history as we normally understand human history, you know, with, uh, you know, where we're talking about politics and economics and things like that and intellectual stuff. Um, and he brings the story up to date. Uh, and so in the final chapter of that book, Sapiens, he talks mm. about the fact that we are now on the verge of being able to intelligently design not only ourselves, you know, through genetic engineering and artificial intelligence, but, you know, to re-engineer the entire world. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, at the end of that book, he's already setting up the premise for this book, which I've reviewed, uh, which, by the way, the, the, the proper name of it is Homo Deus, Homo not Deus, Deus, no, Deus right. right? So, Deus. Deus, yeah, Deus, right. I mean, so, like, the, 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 the word Deus is the Latin word for God. Okay. Uh -huh. Homo God. Yeah, that's, right. yeah so enough. that's the and, and that's kind of a key to where we're going here with this. Okay. Yeah. Um, so he says we're moving from Homo sapiens, which is um, man the wise, man the knower, uh, to um, Homo Deus, which is the the God man. Mm -hmm. The God man. And um, mm. and so the book is now the thing that's interesting about this book. I think there's many different aspects that are interesting. One aspect is, of course. The thesis of the book, which is that in some sense that he specifies, we are turning ourselves into gods. I mean, that is kind of what he's saying, um, and, and he's, but, but, he, but he has a certain kind of conception of God that we're turning ourselves into, and that's also interesting. Hmm. Um, now, I think that the, uh, you know, from the standpoint of your listeners and viewers, hmm. um, probably the most interesting thing about this book is that the way he develops the argument is basically by mobilizing resources uh, and information that I think would be very familiar to people who follow the transhumanist movement. Oh, yes, there's no doubt about it. It's absolutely that, no that's doubt right. So, yeah, look, so look, the look, thing is... When, 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 when I was doing this course, at the end of the course, like, I knew it was coming. I was actually writing in the yeah. comments that he's going to be talking about post-humans anytime soon, right? Yeah. And, and lo and behold, he did, and people were freaked out. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, and, and now the interesting thing is that in the uh, reviews that I've seen of the book so far, and, and, and I should say the book is coming out officially now, uh, and so he's doing a speaking tour of the UK this week. Uh, you know, so the, and and, and the, view, the reviews I've seen so far, I don't, think, I don't think any of them actually makes explicit reference to transhumanism. This is interesting, right? So people know about you know, genetic engineering, and they know about artificial intelligence. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, they know about all this stuff already. Oh, right. um, but what they don't know, uh, and this is where what makes Harari's book kind of interesting, is um, Harari is putting the stuff together in a way that would be recognizable to transhumanists, and he does 
have some footnotes where he actually makes reference to various transhumanist figures like Kurzweil and Nick Bostrom and people like that. Mm -hmm. So he's quite clearly on top of the, the, right. the, the movement in that respect. Oh, yes. Um, so, so this is kind of interesting. Now, um, I have to say, I think uh, very much in keeping with books of this kind, um, Harari's own views, I would say, are a bit detached. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, in other words, this is not the book of an enthusiast. Okay? Right. He is, he's, it's just so trying he's to not, look at it like it, it, it's just another um, extension in this big, uh, broad sweep of history. Really. Something like that. But, but he's, it's a, maybe a little bit more. I would say he has a very uh, well, almost kind of ironic take mm -hmm. on the human condition because he basically thinks that, um, you know, we're going to become sm smart to the point of self destruction. Mm -hmm. Okay? So I would put him, uh, in a way I would see him as someone who is uh, relatively sympathetic to the idea of existential risk. Oh, this yeah. kind of, you know, so this idea that, you know, we are getting all these new powers, uh, but these powers are opening up all of these, uh, not only opportunities to improve ourselves, but also, uh, you know, possibilities whereby we just might blow ourselves up in some way. And you, so, so you're not on board with that idea personally, is that right? No, I think I think that in a way is, um, I think that's exaggerated, um, and and I think in a way uh, it makes the story in a way a little easier to take. I, to be honest with you, I think by the idea, the thing about existential risk, it's like when you watch a horror movie. You know, in other words, people love horror movies, right? Because there's a sense in which they can kind of see it from a very detached standpoint, like, oh, my God, these people in the future are going to blow themselves up. What's mm. going to happen? We're on the brink. And, and I think, in a sense, his book has this kind of appeal that a horror movie has mm -hmm. because there's a sense in which you could somewhat detach yourself from it because you can say, well, look, it's not really here yet. It's not going to involve me, right? And so there's all of that kind of, you know, where you can create a distance. Um, yeah, that, that's interesting. But at the same time, it's like attaching it to the end of this historic arc. So it's like people often don't treat fiction um, or the you know the Terminator or uh, what other movies out there like artificial intelligence as being something that will happen to them in their lifetime. It's more like this scary little movie zone that gets ignite part of the brain that's more about story mode and mythology rather than hey we should really plan for the future or you know this is going to happen sometime in my lifetime or whatnot so yeah well no no i agree with you i mean but the thing about his book is um i don't think he um i don't think he really does much in in terms of talking about what we need to plan for okay mm -hmm. Um, so what he does more is to kind of lay out possibilities. So like, again, if you're imagining, you know, that, that we're living through a kind of, um, you know, kind of a sequence of Terminators, you know, and, you know, <laughs> you, you've got this kind of open-ended picture at the end where you're going to have to watch the sequel to see how it plays out. Oh, no, okay? cliffhangers. Yes, exactly. That's right. I think that's <laughs> so exactly... Histori so history in, in like a, in a sort of like a... Um, an American comic form where there's a cliffhanger this, at the end of each, well, each this decade is, or period. See, th this, this is, I think, uh, a part of the appeal of the book is this exactly. Only it's in a, you know, done in a very highbrow sort of way. Mm -hmm. but, but I do think uh, it, it's one of the things that makes, this stuff, makes it easier to talk about this stuff. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. I do, because see, here's the thing. What, one of the things that makes, I think, transhumanism quite scary for people um, is that you've got all these transhumanists talking about what they're already doing to themselves, you know, and about how they're going to have these prosthetics and they're taking all these pills and they're yeah, uploading Stellark, their consciousness. Man. Stellark's a classic one. He's been doing that since like the 60s, yeah. right? <laughs> well, see, that just, that, just, that just freaks people out, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're going to be talking about transhumanism in this highly, you know, personalized mode, yeah. you know, then people are going to say, whoa, that's weird, you know? Uh, but, but see... Harari's not, he doesn't present himself that way, right? Harari's presenting himself as kind of a spectator. And, and so he's kind of, you know, making it easier for you to, you know, to accept that this is happening and it's going to take place in the future. So he's not writing as an advocate. So he doesn't scare anybody, right? Oh, this right, is the yeah. point. Um, but, but he does present a kind of scary story in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so, it is so, a bit scary, but let, let me ask you, do you feel like you're living on the edge of a cliffhanger? No, no, this is the thing, but then I don't, 
I think the existential risk notion has been trumped up and tremendously. I think it's overrated. Um, I mean, I think it's, you know, in a way, I think um, part of the existential risk business, you might say, um, is about a lot of the people who have invested a lot in artificial intelligence, information technology, genuinely not knowing what what is going to happen yes. and being a little of being a little uncertain already that they may have you know done something wrong right it doesn't mean that something wrong is going to happen but they maybe feel a little bit guilty and i think this is part of what is motivating all of the funding and research that's taking place to talk about what are these existential risks how can we anticipate them stop them and so forth but to be honest with you if we're talking about the medium term, so let's say within the next 50 years or so, during the period that the singularity is supposed to happen, um, I actually think that in terms of what is likely to cause major disasters on this planet for human beings, I would not put, you know, superintelligence on the top of the list by any means. I think there are many more, much more prosaic, mundane things that yeah, could sure. be doing like us in. Um, not quite super, but like a sort of a, you know, rat level intelligence going AY and a, like automated warfare or, you know. Sure, exactly. <laughs> Drones. I mean, you know. Drones, oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we, it, it, in fact, you know, as we, you know, if you look at uh, the, the way in which the whole international terrorism thing got started with 9-11, all you needed was 20th century technology to start trouble, Right. And if you look at what's going to, you know, if the global warming thing is, is a real thing and you have to think about, okay, what caused that? Again, it's 19th and 20th century technology, right? It's not this super stuff. Um, and, and I do think that there's a sense in which we can lose our sense of proportion uh, about what is really dangerous, okay? I mean, because, because well, just because we, just, just just because we don't... Do, do you yeah. actually think that there is a like a danger, like a, however small, in your opinion, of superintelligence in the long term? I mean, I think by the time this issue might, might you know, be re, you know something worth talking about, um, I actually think that human beings will have already reached. There would be a lot of there would be a lot more cyborganization of the human condition. Let's put it that way. In other words, there would be a lot more um, technological enhancement of human beings. So, uh, what I imagine will happen in the long term, okay, and and this is where I am very much on board with transhumanism, mm -hmm. is that I think that you know there will be a kind of blending of human and machine into particular individuals, and we and it'll be a new kind of variety that will be introduced into humanity you know um so um you know a lot of these star trek creatures already had this kind of stuff right so, Where they, so you they, mean they, like you, you you think there'll be a different species of like branching out from humans before well this is the thing i mean i mean species is a funny word here because <laughs> species species is a word that was obviously designed for organic life forms right yeah. for animals and plants yeah. and yeah. things like that um but but here we're talking you know we're, we're talking about technology, as it were, becoming part of the reproductive process in, in, a, in an important way mm -hmm. of, of human beings. Yeah, okay? that's right. So it's not just yeah, a and, matter and, of, like, you know, a degree of difference between, like, a human and, like, you know, some, another human with bigger muscles and another human with a bigger brain. It's actually yeah. cyborgs that have uh, yeah, taken exactly. technology and inserted it right into their body and ex extremely yes. uh, changed the type of being that they are. It's a, well, it's that's a right. difference in and, type and, as well. And, well, yes, and see, I actually think that kind, this, th this kind of stuff that we're talking about now is likely to happen before the kind of threats of superintelligence that Bostrom's worried about. Mm. Um, so, in other words, by the time we get to a point where artificial intelligence has developed this kind of autonomous, superintelligence, self-programming kind of capacity, um, I think we will be in a situation where there will be a lot of cyborg type people around and a lot of these people might actually have a considerable amount of sympathy for the super intelligences. So in other words, it would see the thing about existential patients or do you think they'll have some form of like a personhood status where they can actually vote? Well, yes. Well, well, I mean, this is the point, right? And there's a sense in which the clarity of the distinction between them and us 
which I think is very much at the heart of the existential risk business, right? There's us humans and those super intelligences out there that'll get out of control. I think that very sharp distinction is not going to exist. And so in that sense, you're not going to have a situation because it's like this is where it gets where sometimes transhumanism sounds a bit like B movie Hollywood from the 1950s. You know, the them versus us, the Martians that eat the humans, right? I mean, there's a sense of Jesus singularity, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the super intelligence stuff. Yeah, exactly. Zoltan's part of this too. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, there is a kind of 1950s B movie thing going on that I think really does not do justice to the sophistication in which our embeddedness with the new technology is going to take place. And so in that sense, I kind of deny the premise of the whole existential risks thing, that it's an us versus them. There will be intermediate positions. Well, this, this, this is, this is, this is uh, similar to Hugo de Garris' sort of style. It's the Artelex and the humans, and, and there's a bunch of cyborgs in between, but there's going to be a great war between ideological war and a physical war, in fact, a giga death between everybody. And it's going to be absolutely... Well, well, well let's not go crazy here. No, 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 look, I don't know if I buy that, but I do think, I do think it's a much more sophisticated prospect, okay. okay? And so it's not going... Because, look... If you've got human beings that are technologically enhanced in a very substantial way by the time we get to super intelligence, it's entirely possible that the super intelligence will not be allowed to go out of control. Okay? Right? So, in other words, there will be enough of a relationship. You're not allowed to go out of control, Mr. Intelligence. I'm just saying, well, but no, if you don't, I won't give you an apple at the end of the day. No, no, no. But look, if we're going to start talking about android rights and, you know, the, the, what you were just <laughs> mentioning earlier, if we're going to go down that route then we are going to have to think about the appropriate legal social arrangements, you know, in which we allow and do not allow and how we monitor and check and right. all the rest of it. And, and so yeah, exactly. this, is and why... this is not, this is not uh, new to you. You spoke at the personhood beyond the human conference. Exactly. Exactly. And, 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 and I think people are already considering this and I think it's a reasonable thing to consider. And I think all of these, legal social structures will be in place for all of these hybrid beings that will be developed so that the whole prospect of there being the super intelligence that can kill all of us somehow I, I don't think that'll really ever come on the table i don't think that'll ever happen well you're absolutely convinced it'll never happen or you think it's just a low probability i think look i think i think the only way this would happen would be if it happened soon let's put it that way you know it, because now of course there are there are few, if any, substantial cyborgs around. There are some cyborgs, of course, but they're not really, you know, of the kind we've just been talking about. Um, well, they but, don't wear but, capes and stockings, and they can't say... No, no, I don't mean right. that. I, I mean, the, right. they're not technologically enhanced in such a way that they can kind of interface with machines easily and all the rest of it. I mean, we don't really have those kinds of beings around yet, but oh, we you, will you, get you, them. Have you seen some of Stellark's work recently? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Come on, there's a difference. Look, this, that, that's, you know, this is more than cosmetic surgery. I mean, come on. Yeah, yeah. well, he was connected to the internet. And other people were sending nerve stimulations. To yeah, 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 I know, okay. And they were moving can, him around. But I we can go, we can go much him. farther than that. We can, yes. we, we'll go, yes, we're going to go much yeah, farther than yeah, that. Yeah. And that. And then it'll be interesting, okay? I don't think it's so, I mean, I think it's in, entertaining and it's suggestive, but we're not there yet. But the problem is, because I think this is what maybe some of these people like Bostrom are thinking, Namely, that um, the superintelligence might come much faster than we think, right? And then it is a problem, because you then still have this big gulf between the humans and the machines. And if the machines were suddenly to become autonomous overnight and, you know, self-program and all these kinds of things, um, then it would be very serious, because there would be this enormous gap between the humans and the machines. But that assumes, I think, that this, this, uh, this superintelligence thing happens relatively soon. Okay, well, relatively like 10 soon. Years, twenty years. What about yeah, 20 ten years? or twenty years? But the longer it takes, the less likely it'll be. Let's put it that way. The less likely there'll be a big enough gulf such that a the exactly. superintelligence it's, will be a danger. That's the way to think about it. Yeah, that's right. exactly right. Okay. Well, well, in that case, uh, I mean, what would be the difference between like a you know um, the average cyborg superintelligence? I mean, like we could have very smart people who um, you know. Are, based in their kernel, their evolutionary kernel, they, they're selfish twits who run around, you know, trying to make the world better for themselves mostly and not for others. 
Should, yeah, should no, we no. be worried about those sorts of people, you know, becoming... Sure, but they already exist. Uh, we can talk about that without bringing in transhumanism, they do, right? right, but they're not that smart. Like, it, let's just say you had, like, a real evil genius. Okay. <laughs> no, true. But look, I think, a, look, a lot, of the, a lot of the story here uh, is going to depend on the degree to which these beings are socialized, right? Um, and, and I think that the thing about the, the superintelligence, I think the... What, what makes it a kind of an appealing idea to, to the people who, who take this seriously is that you're sort of imagining the superintelligence develops these capacities in an asocial environment, right? That in some sense, we're not keeping track of them. They're, re, you know, they're, they're self-programming faster than we can keep up with them, right? The I mean, only that's interface a, they have between to humans is via Turing test, right? Well, right. Every now and again. Yeah, and, they, and, and, they, and they keep on fooling us, right? Yeah. I mean... Uh, and, and so the thing is that, that this is the problem. I mean, the problem is if, if these beings are not socialized, so we can't actually keep tabs on them as they are changing and developing and so forth. Because the, the you know, the, the kind of, um, you know, sociopathic guy you were just talking about, you know, even if he is technologically enhanced, he probably does have some kind of human interaction. And so there are ways of keeping tabs on this guy, at least in principle, okay? You know, legal system, medical system, whatever. But I think the, the thing, but, but this is why I think it's important that to prevent this superintelligence style catastrophe, that there be these kind of hybrid beings that are generated over time, who in some sense have the technolo technological, some of the technological capacity already embedded in them. So in a sense, they are part of a social setting that is natural to the superintelligence. Mm -hmm. And that will be one of the things that will keep the superintelligence from going nuts. Right. This is yeah, the idea. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. I mean, like, I think it'd be very interesting if we could train uh, a, a, an AI. Um, but remember, like, all you need is just one AI that's not trained socially, that isn't, like, based in the same sort of trained neural net the rest of them are based on, so to speak, I guess. Um, yeah. And that could, that, that could cause a problem. Um, but, yeah, I mean, like, that's super intelligence. And Yuval does speak about that in his new book, right, does he? You said he references yes. Bostrom, so I'd be surprised if he wasn't speaking about superintelligence. And oh, yes, yes. And footnote is, just to give people a sense of how popular his last book, Sapiens, was, it was on mm -hmm. um, the reading list of a lot of, like, really smart or smart billionaires. Uh, um, I think yes. that's his name, the Facebook co-founder Mark Zuckerberg uh, had it on his reading list, his public reading list. and thought it I was think really Bill good. Gates did too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bill Gates had super intelligence on his reading list. I'm not yeah. sure if Mark Zuckerberg did, though. Um, but yeah, I mean, these, these books are reaching some pretty high profile and very influential people in the world, mostly in the tech sector. I don't see that many people outside the, or that many like really smart billionaires speaking about this outside of the tech sector. Though, you know? Well, but, but, but the, I mean, but again, if you read the book, the thing is he does, he ends up making information technology the, the, the leading hmm. wave of history, right? Hmm. I mean, I think, uh, you know, <laughs> so, so in a sense, he's, he's kind of, he's really chiming with them, right? Yes, he's, that's right. I mean, like, it's no surprise that most of <laughs> the people who attend my meetings are from information technology backgrounds or science backgrounds, philosophy backgrounds. It's, it's, it's incredible. I guess yeah, we'll, I know, mean, we'll know that like the, the transhumanism and like the, all, all the neighboring concepts is made into the mainstream. We see Hillary Clinton with a photo reading superintelligence or homo yeah. deus or whatever. Right? Yeah. Or the singularity. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 this is the thing. I mean, because if you think about all of the, all of the other big issues that you might say our defining of the human condition, um, even though he talks about them uh, somewhat, you know, so, so he talks about the Anthropocene, about the way in which human beings have changed the climate of the, of, of the earth and all of this. Um, these things actually, are, in terms of the way he, he balances things in the book, it, it takes a relative backseat, actually. Um, the techno information technology thing is really driving the narrative uh, to the extent that he pretty much says that he believes that biology is going to be reduced to a kind of, you know, bioinformatics, basically. Okay, um, he's really quite explicit about that. Uh, so, so the the so so in a way, he really pushes this line very very strongly, and 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 and, and, and sort of relates everything else to it. Right. So, so, I so do, you, do you agree with him, like in that sense? I, mean, uh, like, I think it's. I I think it's. Um, See, here's the thing. A, a, I, I, where, where I do agree with him completely 
is uh, the significance of this kind of uh, information revolution, which is uh, computationally inspired, uh, and, and that this has been, you know, the biggest driver of social, economic, you know, maybe soon to be political change, uh, you know, since the middle of the 20th century, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't have any objection to that. That's fine. Uh, that's that's cool. Um, I think the, the, where I do have some issues with him, and this would be an interesting thing for you know, if I ever had a chance to talk to him and or have some kind of exchange with him, would be on the privileging of silicon in all of this. I mean, because um, it is true that um, you know the information revolution, com of computer technology, and you know, starting from cybernetics onwards is very much inspired by the computer, okay? And of course, computers have developed uh, tremendously, and, and they are kind of the, the standard bearer of, uh, of uh, maybe even of transhumanism itself, right? Certainly of the singularity. When one talks about what the singularity is about, it's talked about in computational terms, right? Moore's Law, all that kind of stuff. And this is always imagined as something is happening in a silicon base. This is the thing. And I'm wondering, whether that aspect of the story is necessary, okay? The silicon aspect of it. Um, because one of the things that, um, that you know, we run into as a, as a kind of a, a problem of, of efficiency, you might say, is that at the moment, um, computers, you know, in terms of what the brain does, so look at the brain, right, for a moment. Oh, boy, the um, carbon is a much, like, more uh, complicated... Software, exactly. Right? It, it, it's, Ex it's got a lot more potential than... Exactly, yeah. exactly. And I think he really ignores that. This is okay. the point. For him, the brain is the big computer, and he's looking forward to the day when computers will be able to do what the brain does, right? As mm. if, you know, as, you see, that's kind of the way he pitches the story. Mm. What he doesn't look at is, you know, the intrinsic properties of carbon that actually enables the brain to be as efficient as it is. And that to reproduce in silicon as, as a substrate. That you, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that that the that the energy requirements are enormous, mm. you know, for a computer to do what the brain does if it were able to do what the brain does, it Which would is, short circuit the planet. Right. I mean, we've got such a long history of using silicon. There's just so much entrenched um, sort know. of understanding of how how it works. It's very hard to deviate from silicon, and and carbon's a lot more complicated. It's hard to keep keep under control. Uh, based no, that's on what right. We understand, no. right. So silicon's no, for sure. easier. <laughs> sure, for sure. No, no. If there's a super intelligence problem, it would be with the with a you know enhanced brains and carbon. <laughs> you know, well, there's um, no there's no reason why um, we'll it, it's it's impossible in principle for us to artificially create carbon-based substrates that can be extremely efficient to compute on. Exactly. So, I mean, and they've been trying to do this stuff with graphene for quite a while, um, graphene-based yeah. transistors and such. So. Yeah, see, I would, this is where I would go. I, I, I would push that line of the story more. I think it's more intellectually interesting. Um, I think it because I think it then brings the organic in a way back into the picture a little bit more clearly. Um, but as you say, it does complicate matters and it's not so clear how we're going to do it and all the rest of it. Um, but I do think that, you know, given that Harari himself places such great emphasis on efficiency as a kind of driving force in the human condition, right? Um, because he thinks this might be one of the ways in which humans become obsolete, right? right? that in a sense computers can do everything much more efficiently than we can, so what the hell are we around for, right? We're just sucking up space. After all, right? the economy is just there for efficiency, right? Yeah, well, this yeah. is the thing. But I'm saying if you the really are talking... People enjoy it. But, but the point the is, efficiency isn't just simply getting things done more quickly and more cheaply in terms of financial, you know, inexpense, right? We're also talking about energy usage, Okay. Uh, and there, I don't think he really touches the issue sufficiently. That, in fact, if we, but the, if we were to have computers, given our computer technology now, that could do all the things that could, re, you know, re, uh, render humans redundant, um, it would. The energy requirements of it would blow the planet to smithereens. It would. Right. This is the point. Humans might be less efficient in the sense of taking longer to do things and so forth, but we're but we take up less energy. You know, see, and, and, and I do think this is this aspect of the efficiency issue is something that Harari doesn't really come to grips with. Um, and it's one of the things that I think will continue 
to make the, the, you know, this kind of argument, brain versus computer, still an interesting argument to have, mm -hmm. okay? Because it isn't just about processing power, mm -hmm. right? It's more than that. There's more than that going on there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would say, you know, from, from the substantive standpoint of where he sees the future of science and technology, that would be my main objection to the way he pitches the story, but he pitches it in a way that I think obviously will appeal to the information technology crowd because they're not thinking about brains as carbon substrate or anything like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So about the way he, he's uh, built this narrative, this his wide his historical spectrum, this sweeping historical narrative across you know, the human expanse of time, is, is there anybody ever done that before in the way that he has? Or is this like a, a new normal, novel phenomenon that he's been able to, to achieve? Well, I mean, uh, I mean yeah, with, well, with reference to like where humanity might be going in the future, a la oh, there's transhumanism a, there's a, and posthumanism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's quite a lot of literature of this in the most, gen you know, talking about this in the most general way, namely, about the future of humanity, how, you know, and, and in particular, how can you use history as a kind of guide to tell you where the future is going? Um, there's actually quite a lot of that. Um, I think it, that one of the things that's been What's very the best interesting... Example, would you say? Well, I mean, the, 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 the thing is that, that, that Harari is combining two genres, you might say, of this kind of literature, which has existed for a long time. So there's the first kind of genre, which you already find in the Greeks, okay, mm -hmm. um, you know, with uh, people like Thucydides, for example. And it's basically a kind of account of um, human history that's based on the endless replaying of human nature, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a sense in which, you know, so you could talk about, you know, history as one damn thing after another, a series of events. But then you'll get this historian come in, and you had this with the ancients, right, who would say, well, you know, I've seen this somewhere before. This is something about the way human beings are just recycling itself over and over again in different permutations, but it's the same stuff. Humans are just in this, you might say, you know, kind of species rut. This is what humans do. They act this way, no matter what the circumstance is, and this is why they succeed for a certain amount of time, and then they collapse, and then they succeed again, and it's a kind of cycle, cyclical view of history, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is something the ancients had. Now, when you get into the Christian era, um, you start to get a different style of history, okay, going on, um, and this is... Now, you know, as you can see, if you read Harari, Harari makes a lot of reference to evolution and the way evolution kind of provides certain kind of default settings for the way human beings operate mm -hmm. and all of this. And that's very much like this kind of more ancient approach, you know, where there's a human nature that's grounding everything. But, but one of the things that you get in the Christian era is you get a kind of somewhat different narrative, which is a more linear narrative going on. And, and Harari definitely has that too. And, and this is the idea that um, we make some kind of progress, right? That in a sense, the, 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 the future is in some way a better state or at least a, a greater state for the species than the past was, okay? And, and this is played out in terms of human beings discovering more about themselves and the world, expanding their powers over the world. Um, and, and, you know, in the Christian tradition, this was always seen as somehow a sign that, you know, we're heading toward paradise, toward heaven, you know, and this became, in, in the Enlightenment, this got secularized and became the narrative of progress, where science takes over, you know, the role of Christianity in kind of driving the whole process forward and bringing human beings to what one might call a kind of godlike position, having started out in a sort of fallen animal-like position, okay? And this is very much part of the grand kind of enlightenment style of story. You find this um, Condorcet in the late 18th century already. And Condorcet, I mention him um, he, because he was one of the guys who really stressed the role that technology played in elevating the human condition. So he believed, for example, the rise of um, publishing, right? Gutenberg, mm -hmm. right? The movable printing press and all of this stuff that this unleashed the possibility of human beings around the world um, 
communicating with each other in ways they couldn't do before to such an extent that he imagined that in the future, as this became easier to do, and he's writing in 1794, okay, um, that uh, we would have a global brain. He's the one who put that idea on the table, that mm-hmm. the world brain, the global mind, this kind of thing. H.G. Mm-hmm. Wells made a big deal about it. You know, you find a lot of, a lot of science fiction people talk about it. Um, he was the first one to put this. And so in a way he starts, Condorcet, I would say, is kind of a, a very good precedent for the kind of thing that Harari's doing, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, um, but he presents the story in a pretty positive vein, right? In other words, he doesn't Condor make the Say story... Does. What? Condorcet does. Who? Harari? Condorcet does, yeah. yes. Condorcet makes the story positive. Um, uh, you know, so in other words, there's no cliffhanger at the end of his story, right? <laughs> he actually okay. believes that the only thing that human beings need to do in order to fully realize this paradise that, in, that the information technology of his day, the printing press, would allow us would be to overturn all of these defunct monarchies and authoritarian regimes. And so he's one of the guys who was inspirational to the French Revolution, okay? Um, but they cut his head off in the end because they didn't quite like him. I mean, he was, a, he was an aristocrat, so... He wasn't he was romantic cut, enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. But, 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 but the point was that, that he thought that the only thing that held people back was just bad government, And now a lot of guys in Silicon Valley today think the same thing, of course. (laughs) Right, right. So it's not that different. (laughs) But but the point was that that he, like the Silicon Valley guys, believe that that information technology was going to liberate us. And all we need to do is to remove all of these archaic, antiquated social structures that hold us back. And Harari, I would say, is part of that, you know, part of that kind of thinking, very much so. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's certainly taken off. I mean, like, uh, before he wrote Sapiens, I didn't think he was that um, popular. Like, he put a, like a course up on Coursera. His book had only been translated into German um, and uh, Yiddish or whatever, um, yeah. and hadn't even reached English yet. So at the time, he wasn't probably a very popular um, academic. Well, no, I mean, he's, he's, he's only about 40 or something. In fact, he's uh, only a senior lecturer at the University of Tel Aviv. He's not really a professor in the, in the British sense. Hmm. But I think now people are struck, like you know, are, are getting in line to have him come and speak, or you know, to do an interview with him. It's 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 taken off that well. His his approach. What I mean, yeah. why why did it take off? Why did it seem to did it just press the right buttons at the right time? Or well, I do think timing is important here, of course, because nothing that he says is particularly original. Okay, I mean, um, right. but what he's doing that's very creative is putting the stuff together in a very artful kind of way, right? Um, I mean, if you're a good popular historian, one of the things you're able to do is you're able to mobilize various narrative forms that people are already familiar with from fiction, from movies, you know, from, from popular culture generally. Yet you can, you know, what the content is stuff that is, you know, the latest theoretical thinking on something or what we know about the origins of humanity, all of this kind of stuff. And so he's got this mixture going on that's actually very well done, very artfully done. He's a very well-read guy. He follows all the right theories. I mean, if you look at one of the things that I said in my review was that, uh, in a sense, he uh, w- was trying to create, in, in this latest book, Homo Deus, uh, a kind of um, what, what Aldous Huxley called the perennial philosophy. And, and the perennial philosophy is basically a kind of way of seeing the world that works at any time in history you might look at it, right? Because it's got that kind of general scope to it. It's, you know, it's not just a, a theory about our time, but it's a theory about all time. And, and, and Huxley's view was, uh, Aldous Huxley's view, was that um, the great religions have something of this to them, right? And that what we needed in the modern period was to get some kind of combination of the great religions into a kind of secular perennial philosophy. He was writing this right after World War II, where he was reflecting at all, uh, you know, of all the carnage that was done and where human beings were going to go in the future. And that was the context in which he wrote about this in the late 1940s. And I, and I think that Harari's got this kind of mentality as well. 
except that he's not drawing on the great world religions, really. Uh, he's drawing on neuroscience and evolutionary biology and artificial intelligence and cognitive science, right? Mm. And, and, and so he's drawing on those sciences as providing a kind of perennial philosophy that can inform us about, you know, everything that's happened in human history, right? Both past, present, and future. So, so I think that's kind of where, you know, and I think that appeals to people. The point is that kind of thing appeals to people because they, they come away thinking they've got an answer. They've got some answers in their hands, right? You know, they kind of get, get a sense of, okay, I understand now why we have marriage as an institution, or I understand now why we have this or why we have that, right? And you just start bringing in all this stuff, right? You could start saying, it's the reptilian brain, you know, or something like this. Uh, and, 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 and it starts to make sense in some way, right? So this is the idea of having a perennial philosophy that you can just bring out to explain why things are the way they are and why they're going the way they are. Well, I mean, like, like yeah, so evolutionary psychology has been used for that purpose for, exactly. you know, you know and, and, and he's, anyway. Yeah, and he's projected it on history itself. And, and um, you know, the other thing I should also say is that, that it's not that historians... It's not that historians have ignored this stuff, okay? I think it's worth saying that there are actually quite a lot of, you know, scholarly practicing historians, professors at major universities who are working on things like so-called big history, deep history, long history, right? Where they're basically looking at the long, you know, the, the large-scale long-term determinants of the human condition from things like environmental change to looking at how the brain is, you know, changed over time because our diets have changed, things like that. I mean, there's a lot of real work done on all that by historians already. Uh, and, and in a sense, Harari is building on that. He's appropriating all that stuff to give this overarching narrative. Um, mm. and, I, and I do think it's, it's also true, it's also fair to say that I don't think all of this stuff about big history and long history and deep history has ever been mobilized, you know, in a way to project transhumanism mm -hmm. as the future. I right. think that's mm -hmm. a very, it's a big selling point, you might say, of the book, is that he does do that. Right, okay. So it is interesting that, do you think he actually came to the ideas of transhumanism by himself, or do you think he picked up a literature that already existed? Do you think... Yeah, Do you, uh, well, maybe a bit of both. Uh, I'd I, think he, well, I, I think he's very, well, first of all, he got his PhD from Oxford. So he may have had something to do with Bostrom at some point. Okay? It depends how many years ago it was. But, I, you know, the future of humanity, I mean, if you think about it, it, it is possible that when he was in Britain, he may have picked up something. Okay? Mm, okay. As a student. Mm. Um but I think, generally speaking, if you look at his, because I, I am curious to, I always look at the footnotes to find out where he's getting his stuff from. Because if you, the, the thing about the book that makes it very readable is that the book doesn't, um, let's put it this way, the book wears its scholarship lightly, okay? In other words, you don't see the, you don't see the research on the page. You got to go to the footnotes, really, to see all the stuff he's been reading that backs up the claims he's making in the book. Because the book itself doesn't really give you that. You have to look at the notes. He's got a lot of notes. Okay, um, that's good. Looks... Yeah, yeah. Um, no, no, it's 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 it's, it's good a that you got the notes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but 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 the but the thing that's interesting, and this is what makes it a popular book, is he keeps the two things separated, right? So that you can read the straight narrative, and if mm. you're not interested in getting into anything any more deeply, the story still still sounds good. It has right. a surface attractiveness to it. Let's right. put it that way. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Whereas Bostrom's super intelligence books has it has it, the notes right in the middle of the, the chapter. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> right, right. And and so but it, but looking at his notes, what what I discover, I would say, is that he's a very well read guy. Hmm. Um but um he kinda like reads one thing of everything. You know, so in other words, he reads like the one book on superintelligence. He reads the one book on singular, you know, so when he talks about transhumanism, it's Kurzweil, right? It's, it's, if it's existential risk, it's Bostrom, right? He's got that way of operating. Okay. So I don't, I don't get the sense from reading him that he's, um, that he gets into the stuff too deeply. No, no I haven't okay. seen his name pop up on like, you know, transhumanist meetup groups or, you know, on no. forums around like talking about these topics no, but he, at but, all. But he, 
but he reads the stuff that if you wanted to familiarize yourself, you know, and you wanted to kind of pass as competent on transhumanism in a cocktail party, mm. but, uh, you know, Harari's at that level. Mm. He, can, he, he could fake his way in a discussion of transhumanism in a cocktail party. Okay. And, yeah, well, yeah, I think that's the level. I mean, uh, and I think that applies probably for everything else he's talking about in there. <laughs> Well, he's a historian. No, I mean, but that's, but that's, well, that's the thing. I mean, I, I mean, I, this is, you know, this is why I, I describe the book as suave, but not particularly deep. Um, and I think the people who find the book incredibly fascinating, I think it reveals something about their reading habits. You know, in other words, the stuff should not be so fascinating to you. You should find this relatively familiar, what he's saying. What is interesting about him is he's got a good style. He's got a good way of putting things. He, he does bring does, some yeah. things together that, that aren't normally seen as being together. It's very provocative. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but, but I don't think you should be surprised. I mean, the content shouldn't be that surprising. This is the point. I don't think the content should be surprising. Well, but some reviewers... Thing. At the moment, what? how how many people do you really think are on to the, who've, who've, seen, who've got the post-it notes, who've seen the writing on the walls... <laughs> who got the memo somehow that, like, yes, we're moving into a transhuman or post-human or a condition where, you know, um, we may have very smart AIs in the future. Technology is driving uh, humanity fast ahead. Uh, how many people just think today's, uh, tomorrow's just going to be enough version of today with extra blinking lights and maybe iPhone 9 or whatever? Well, I think, I, I here's the thing. Um, I think most people probably fall into this category of the uh, the great unwashed, as you were presenting them just now. Um, but but the problem is, I don't think. I mean, I think it's less a matter. Look, let's put it this way. I think most people now. Well, let me. This problem. Uh, this problem has many levels to it. Okay, I want to get one level of it out of the way. The one group of people who consistently definitely see the writing on the wall are children. Oh. Okay? I interview a lot of kids. My colleague Emily Whitaker and I have interviewed a lot of kids about their views about the future. Kids from 6 to 16. We've done a lot of this stuff. We, we've got all the recordings and everything. We just don't have the time to put it together. But the one thing that I can tell you is they see the writing on the wall. Whether they like what's coming or not, is there's disagreement amongst them, of course, but they see the writing on the wall. So in terms of what you were asking, the kids are on board. They know that the transhuman future is happening for better or worse. They know it's happening. Okay? The adults are the problem. Okay? Is that always the, the problem? <laughs> yeah, so let's talk about the adults. Now, now the, the, the thing about the adults is it's not that they don't know this stuff is being talked about and said. I think, I think you would have to be living in a hole if you don't know that people are talking about this stuff. Okay? Um, I think they just don't believe it. I think that's what it boils down to, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the question is, why don't they believe it? They believe so many other things that are crazy. Why don't they believe this? Because you know? it, it doesn't fit in their little zone of craziness, you know what I mean? Like, well, this is, is the thing. Yeah. I was I'll put up with someone today. Um, I think it's just sometimes people need some big authority figure who they know and trust to give them like the, the tip of the hat, the nod, you know, the right sort of uh, sign, the right handshake or whatever, to let them know that they're allowed to take a subject or a, a particular like idea seriously or not. So even in the skeptics community and in like, you know, the atheist community, there's a lot of people who, who uh, treat this sort of stuff as lunatic sort of quackery, but don't actually um, speak up too much about it because they feel a bit browbeaten when they're proven wrong. But in any case, the important thing is, um, is that they're, they're looking for a sign from, from one big authority figure to, to give them the signal that it's okay to think about these stu this stuff and take it seriously, you know what I mean? It's no, like I, the Pope I, yeah. needs to tell his citizens that it's okay to not wear condoms anymore or, you know, you can, you, or whatever. Okay. So. Well, the Pope helped the environmental movement tremendously, right? I mean, he's, <laughs> he, he's the best thing that ever happened to them. Okay. I mean, uh, <laughs> well, you but, know what but, I mean. Yeah, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. No, no, I know what you mean. Here, right? I mean uh, <laughs> Maybe but, the but, transhumanists need to wear funny hats. No, 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 no. I, I, I mean, I, I see, I see what you're saying that the the need for an authority figure. 
But I think there's also a kind of subtle problem because you might ask, why aren't academics taking this stuff more seriously? Because, you know, academics, you might say, oh, these are supposed to be the real, these are professionally smart guys, right? These are the guys that are supposed to know what's going on in the world. Why don't they take oh. this stuff more seriously? Well, because they, it, they're, they're worried about losing face and losing funding. But, and, they're, and their universities that take, you know, who, who, are, who, um, who are paying them don't want them to go too far. Or as, uh, they, they think that their university will look bad. You know well, I mean, I mean, I think there's a little bit of that. I, I mean, I think... I don't I know how they keep you on the payroll. But. <laughs> well, no, but I think there's a... Prof the, uh, the way I would put it is that there's a prof there are professional disincentives to to taking this stuff seriously yeah. you know so for example let's take my field sociology right um i have no problem getting students interested in this stuff there's no problem there okay um the problems start when people try to design research topics that they then are trying to pitch to sociological journals or funding bodies or whatever and that has a lot to do with the way in which the social sciences so we just focus on them for a moment, um, kind of see the world. And that is that the problems that society face are the problems that it, they, it, that it has already been facing, right? So in other words, uh, you know, you're not looking at the problems that will arise in the future before they happen. No, that's futuristics. That's futurology, right? That's prophecy. That's not stuff that we do as social scientists, right? No, what we do is we look at problems that are already here and have been here forever. And they never seem to go away because we're comfortable with that. That's the comfort zone. Uh -huh. The comfort zone is poverty, right? Crime, right? Those kinds of things understood in not cybercrime. That's still a little outre, right? But, you know, people beating each other up in the streets and, and stealing stuff, right? That's cool, right? We can understand that. And we could talk about deprived backgrounds till the cr cows come home, you know, as being the source of crime and all the problems of the world and poverty and all this. That's the comfort zone. But if you start talking about problems that are going to, that, that are likely to arise because of technologies that are right here or on the horizon, then you just blow people's minds. They don't know, because they can't use their traditional modes of analysis to make sense of what's going on. And so as long as we continue to have crime and poverty and all those other issues in the normal way, as long as they still exist, and they do exist, of course, um, then social scientists are still happy to play the old game, mm. right? Mm. And so they're going to wait, you know, so, <laughs> so, so this is the, the, so there's a professional disincentive, basically, okay? You know, so, so, so for, you know, even take an issue like global warming, okay? Mm. Now, global warming, the way this registers in social science isn't necessarily because people are thinking about, my God, it's going to happen. How are we going to reorganize the world, blah, blah, blah. No, that's not the level. The level happens in terms of studying the way in which people are organizing, trying to fight environmental issues. Right. That's how it's, so it's, it's done in a, so, so let's put it this way. I have a PhD student now who may, who may be contacting you at some point. His name is James McFarlane. Oh, cool. Uh, and, this is, and he this was, is not the guy who, who wrote Family Guy, okay? It's, no, 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 no. McFarlane. Yeah, it's not his That's Seth different McFarlane. No, okay. no, his, father's, he's, his father works for IBM. He's a respectable man. <laughs> um, the, um, <laughs> the thing is that this guy, this student of mine, okay, is doing a PhD, um, and, he, and he recently attended this, uh, this uh, what would you call it, biggest life ex uh, light longevity festival in the universe, right? In San Diego, RAD, R-A-E-D. R-A-T. Yeah, well, I thought it was like full of old people. That's what I heard. Was, uh, there, were a lot of, there were a lot of Zimmer frames. That's oh, what I was okay. told. Okay, <laughs> but never mind. The point is, so he was, in, he was doing some field work, right? Mm. Doing some field work on transhumanists in their native habitat. So he went to this festival, okay? <laughs> Yeah, well, but, but the, my, my point is that this is, this is how you do sociology, okay? Yeah, yeah, this, this is good. I like this. This is how you do sociology. And so he may be contacting you as well. Oh, cool. But the point right. is... Field but this research, is, hey? I'd, I'd yeah, like but, to become a specimen. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but the point is... What you, so so you do, you're not talking about what the future world is going to look like, but rather what you're doing is you're talking about what's happening on the ground. You know, so if you know, if you want to study transhumanism, you study you study our conversation, right? Mm -hmm. This is what you study. Yes, yes you don't yes, study yes. what we're talking about. You You're study what we're saying we're to each other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. no, this is it. All right. Yeah. 
and, and social I just, norms that are, that are sort of the, that are sort of uh, breeding in these in these. Hey, let me tell you something. If some if somebody if a proper sociologists studied our conversation, mm -hmm. they would be coding all of our words, all of our silences. <laughs> really? They would look, be looking for oh, and, and they would have all forms kinds of analyses of this kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. Words used a lot, you know what the significance is. You know what kinds of topics we talked about, but but understood in this non-committal way, right? right. Okay. You know, hmm. so in other words, they wouldn't say, "Oh, these guys are saying some profound things," or "Or these guys are idiots." No, they wouldn't make any judgments, right? Mm -hmm. They would just study this as a kind of form of social interaction. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, and and I think, you know, now now my my student McFarlane is 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 smarter than that, and he's going to hmm. do more with the thesis. Hmm. But the point is, in order to launch the thesis hmm. as a sociological thesis. In terms of the the kind of the style of research you need to do to even get this kind of thing accepted, is like that. It 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 really kind of inhibits you from doing the kind of future forward looking mm. kind of perspective, even though that is kind of what we should be doing when we see all these emerging technologies taking place. Right. Well, is it one of my favorite sort of um, I don't know if you call him a futurist, but Norbert Weiner, he was interesting, right? And he was all about cross disciplinary research. Yeah. And so you mean look, Nor Norbert Wiener? Yeah, Wiener, not Weiner. Sorry, I said. Yeah, Weiner. the, the founder Wiener. of cybernetics. The cyber. Yeah, fight, yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, was he the founder? Yeah, he oh, he, he coined the word. He coined the word, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah, he wrote the first book on it. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, um, like he said, he, uh, a quote somewhere along the lines is like, in order to um, solve the big problems, we can't just stay put in our little um, academic sort of narrow disciplines. We need a lot of cross cross disciplinary um, research being done. So my question to you is, as a sociologist, if you had the time, what other academic or what other research disciplines would um, complement uh, what you do and would you know give you like a, a like a, a fresher, brighter outlook on the future? Actually, I'm not saying you have to look at the future positively, but like um, <laughs> one which you could see no, the future no. more clearly. You know, I'll, I'll tell you. I mean, I, my whole um, my whole academic career has been interdisciplinary. My my Yo, PhD yes, was in history yes. and philosophy of science, actually. Yes, that's right. Um, uh, and and so, um, I mean, I I would say what what is it, uh, so I'm interested in all fields, and I try to take some kind of in you know interest you know participate in some way, even peripherally. Uh, okay, in cool. them, and I've published in several fields. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, yeah. so take the question as, as one. Um, but, but, but there is. I, I, other, I, uh, no, no, but I want to. I want to add. I mean, I, I do think, I do think that as we learn more about, as as we as it becomes easier to uh, alter our genetic makeup and alter our brains and the way it functions, um, I think it becomes more and more important. I think for social scientists. To learn about biology and neuroscience mm. because there is no longer this kind of hard divide you know where the social is this thing that you can change as you wish whereas the biology is just this fixed thing you know that never changes right because that's kind of the stereotype that we get from the social science side right that in a sense you know genetics are always fixed and there's nothing you can do about it um and and uh, and and so that's why in the past when you had social scientists say that things were quote biologically determined mm. right they were often seen as racists and you know people who were forcing a an overly deterministic view of the human condition right um whereas in fact given that we know that the biology and the and the and the, and the brain uh, are very are very malleable very plastic you could change it that then i think social scientists need to take a much more active interest in it okay uh because in a sense one of the ways in which we may be able to solve social problems in the future is by some kind of brain manipulation or genetic engineering or something like that. I mean, I'm not saying that I endorse any particular proposal on the table because, of course, there are all these people out there you know, who talk about moral enhancement, right? Moral enhancement, oh, which yes. is about... Right. Oh, yes, yes. Which I've is, interviewed a number of people. In fact, uh, I just uploaded a video with Anders Sandberg talking about moral. There you go. There you go. Yeah. That's right. Right. Julian I mean, Savalescu's just around the corner. So. Exactly. All these people. All these these Oxford guys. Yeah. You know. I mean. I mean. Um, now, I don't necessarily agree with the particular prescriptions these people are offering, 
But I do think that this is a fair issue to talk about, given what we have now learned about the brain and about genetics. In other words, it's not because, you know, I, I'm, so, so in other words, th there is more to play for here than I think social scientists have thought there was in the past, okay? Um, and, and, I, and, you know, I think as we learn, again, you know, social life uh, is something that obviously has a biological and neurological substructure to it. Okay, when I'm talking to you, my brain is firing, your brain is firing. As we learn more about what is happening there when we're speaking, then obviously this allows us in principle more ways of intervening to alter these things, it seems to me, right? right? You know, uh, and, and, and I think we need to take that a little more seriously. And so down the road, we may want to talk seriously about moral enhancement. That's mm -hmm. the point. I mean, my, my, my main objection with the stuff that currently goes on by that name um, is that it's too coarse-grained. I mean, if you look at the examples that are being proposed, like manipulate, manipulating serotonin levels and things Oxytocin like that. Serotonin levels, yeah, yeah, which actually yeah. increases, like, you know, bonding between, like, uh, family members, but decreases the, yeah. uh, the respect for out-group members, right? <laughs> yeah, so it's, it, it's too it's coarse. Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, the thing is that we're, we're dealing with something, um, you know, it, it, in a way it reminds me of the, uh, old, you know, eugenics, right? If you, if you go back to eugenics in the early 20th century, again, they were trying to solve all kinds of social problems, but, it, but the knowledge of genetics was so coarse-grained that they did it in a very clumsy kind of way, right, which, which led to atrocities in many cases. And I think in a sense, when, you know, the moral enhancement stuff with regard to manipulating the brain has some of this character to it at the moment, largely because it's operating at too clumsy a level. Okay, so so that's interesting. I mean, but how do we get to the non-coarse grain, the less clumsy, the the more refined level? You think this is through some like a discussion and dialectics is the way to go, or what? No, no, no. Well, I'll tell you what's going to have to happen, and this is the tough. I mean, and I think here I am, and I, I think I'm in agreement with most of those guys at Oxford, um, and that is we're going to have to loosen up institutional review board restrictions. In other words, we're going to have to have uh, more invasive studies of human beings yes, to understand. Yeah, yep. Oh no, don't die on me. Hello. Human, human testing. testing. Yes, human in, testing. in other words, in, yeah, in, in, order order to, in order for this moral enhancement stuff to really get some kind of mileage, we need to be able to better connect the research agendas of the biological and neural sciences with those of the social sciences. Um, and that means we need more invasive research, you know, experimental research on human beings doing normal human things and then trying to enhance them in various ways to see what the consequences are, okay? Um, and I think that is the thing that, that will give us a much uh, less coarse grain, a kind of more sophisticated grip on what it takes to get people to respond in ways that we consider to be socially desirable. Well, I can imagine some people putting their hands up for, um, you know, some early stage life extension sort of testing stuff. And we know that, like, people have already started testing on themselves, using them, so, like uh, Liz Paris's patient zero for the BioViva approach, like the elongating of telomeres so as to increase yes. cell life and all that sort of thing. So it's an interesting... Um, uh, uh, development that's happened there. Do you think more of that sort of uh, uh, stuff will start happening in other areas? Do you think people well, will start I, putting up their hands to become more moral? Well, I, let me tell, tell you something. something. I, I think some of this stuff might already, already be happening. In... No, no, you, you know, look, I, some of this stuff may already be happening. That's the, it, it, but, but if it's happening, it's probably happening in China or someplace like that. Um, and uh, this is because um, I, I think you, you can't underestimate the significance of institutional review board guidelines in inhibiting this kind of research. And the problem is if you do this research in the West, especially in an academic context, and you do it sort of under the table, it becomes impossible to publish it, okay? Because uh, journal editors are very scrupulous about this kind of stuff today. So that if you, you, know, you publish a, a paper that involves human subjects, you've got to sign off all kind of ethics forms, not just to do the research, but to get the research published. Um, I mean, you may know, um, 
A couple of years ago, Google and Peter Thiel and a few of these other Silicon Valley types um, came up with this idea of seasteading. Oh, no, yes. 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 I don't think Peter Thiel came up with it. What was it? Is um yeah. Uh, well, Peter, Peter Thiel, no, he's a, he's very much behind it. He's very much behind it. it. I yes. mean, yeah, that's right. Yeah, but the thing, but the thing is, this is probably not going to go anywhere. Yeah. Well, the point is, this is probably not going to go. Yes, Friedman's son, right? Milton Friedman's son. Milton Friedman's son. Yeah, I've interviewed him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, the uh, the thing is that that uh, this didn't. I don't know. I don't think this is going to go anywhere. Um, and, and one of the things that, that I learned about this project that, that was kind of the problem um, was because part of what, what sea setting was going to do was it was going to it was going to exist outside the territorial waters of the United States and Europe and all the major countries and actually allow people to conduct a lot of this very experimental research we're talking about without having to worry about the, the institutional review board codes uh, and what would involve would be mutual contracts between the scientists and the people who volunteer okay, okay. So, so it would be just a fringe, so fringe you, medical tourism well maybe that's one way of looking at it i suppose but but what it would do it, it would free up the scientists hands to engage privately with a lot of these uh people who would be willing to put their hand up to be made more moral to live longer all the rest of it the problem though with this okay isn't is it, it, actually it, it was what they what I think is going to end up killing the idea is the fact that no journal will touch an article done this way done on research based on research done this way no journal will touch this okay they would have to start up their own journals basically okay um, and because it, and, and I think this is this is the kind of world we live in right where people cannot where it's very difficult for human subjects to voluntarily undergo risks of the kind that this kind of adventurous experimentation would uh, would open you to. I think that's the real problem. Um, because I think there are many ideas, many research agendas, and I think you're right that there are many people who would volunteer to do this kind of stuff. Um, but, but, I know them. <laughs> yeah. Sure, exactly, and some of them do it under the table, you know, uh, and and, uh, and and like I say, in places like China, which is kind of an ethics-free zone, you know, there's probably a lot more of that happening there, okay? Um, so I do think, to my mind, that's the main problem. The main problem is, you know, the ethics. There's an ethics uh, kind of hurdle to overcome here. Mm -hmm. But once that's overcome, I think, I think, I think we, we, you know, we, we can start, start doing this stuff. stuff. Okay. But, I mean, like, the, there's got to be some good in the ethics hurdles in a way because the ethics hurdles stop bad research. I mean, there's so much research, well, in, like, in, 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 uh, like uh, in Vietnam or China, that's just bullshit, you know? It's just, some of it's just maybe, ridiculously maybe, bad. Maybe, maybe, maybe. maybe. I, I, think, well, I, I think the strongest argument for the ethics stuff is, is actually... Um, that there are people who might volunteer who are, are doing it, you might say, for financial reasons, right? So vulnerable people might volunteer, you know, you know, so, so, you know, uh, if, if you're, if you, you know, if, if a scientist advertises for a risky experiment, which may have some long-term adverse consequences, there's a good chance the scientist is going to be paying you a lot of money in some way or another, okay? Um, and, um, you know, just so he's not sued. Uh, and, and there are going to be people out there who are going to be motivated by that. And I think that's a real problem from an ethics standpoint, where in a sense what the scientist is doing is kind of potentially playing on the financial you know, vulnerability of potential subjects. I think that's something that, that, that is... Because remember... It's also the problem of like, um, faking research results too, or um, you know, taking p-values and making them mean whatever you want them to mean. Well, I, I, think, yeah, I think that issue, that issue does arise. I don't want to underestimate the significance of that. Um, but I think the issue arises more today because people, researchers are often in competition with each other, and it becomes very important to be the first guy to say the thing. And so you're all working kind of on the same project and things aren't happening fast enough. And so you, you sort of, as it were, anticipate what the results will be if your experiment turns out exactly as the way you want it to. And that's the kind of thing that causes the problem, okay? So people, 
So what people are faking um, is actually, you know, they're not faking it because they didn't do it at all. And it's not even because they didn't do the experiment properly, but rather because they didn't allow it to go long enough, right? They didn't really get, you know, they really didn't establish it. And the way you end up finding out is when some other guy wants to reproduce your results and they can't do it. Okay. And, and I think you get a lot, you get a lot of that kind of problem going on today, but that's mostly because of the competitive character of the scientific research environment. Okay. I think that's what causes it. Um, I think more so than scientists, you know, not being able to sort out the truth and things like this. Mm -hmm. So this competitive no, there are of, of the scientific yeah. research agenda is, um, do you think it's actually halting progress? Or do you think it's like a on balance? Um, like no, the, the competitive, no, no, the competitive, the problem, the, here's the problem with the competitive nature of, of, of science, is that everybody tends to uh, work on the same things, right? In other words, when you see a competitive arena in science, what that what what that should alert you to is that the area is oversubscribed, right? If there's competition, that means there are too many people doing it, right? And so then it becomes important who does it first. Um, and so very competitive areas of science are basically those areas that got a lot of people working on them, right? And where the money is scarce and the rewards for being the first guy there is big. Now, what that means is that a lot of other areas of science get neglected altogether because if people are thinking in a competitive mode, they're going to go to the areas where they think is hot in the sense that there's a lot of money, other people are interested, but they can get there first. If there's no incentive to go to a, a, an area of science where nobody's working on it and there's no money for it. See, and, and so, so I think that this is, you know, so, so, you know, this is the kind of problem I think we've, I mean, it's a general problem, you might say, with the sociology of science as it's constructed today, namely that science has these areas where everybody's working on certain things, but not working on other things, even though the theories are already there, one could come up with hypotheses to test, right, but, but, people, but there's just no incentive to do it. Mm. So do you think like a, a book like um, Yuval's Homo uh, Deus, it's going to sort of change the zeitgeist. I don't really use that word too much, but zeitgeist, zeitgeist. There it is, everybody. Um, I, I, that there well, will be more incentives within the academic arena to get people working on these more prosaic transhuman um, projects. Maybe. I mean, I think where, where he's more likely to have impact is going to be on uh, policymakers, maybe, uh, and the general public. And I think one of the useful things that he does do in the book uh, is uh, he kind of normalizes trend, the, the, the transhuman agenda as a kind of latest stage in the history of humanity. So transhumanism is no longer portrayed as this kind of freaky sci-fi kind of thing that has no relationship with what human beings normally do, but rather it is presented as kind of the, the latest stage in the ongoing development of humanity. Yeah. And I think that is quite an, I think that that's a very, a very strong achievement, actually. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, you know, and I, and I think that's not trivial, and I think that could have some impact in terms of normalizing transhuman thinking within the academy. I mean, you know, the issue about whether, you know, the business about funding for research, I think, involves some other challenges, like these ethics challenges we were just talking about. Uh, but, but I think he's a, it's a step in the right direction, for sure, in his book. Absolutely. I reckon there should be a documentary done about that sort of, with that sort of nature. It might not be directly his stuff, but it could be, you know, this big arc of human history with sort of naturalizing the extension of like a um, technology and where we're, where we're taking that transhumanism, posthumanism, singularity, space exploration. One of the things that I think was particularly poignant, and he's not the first person to really bring this up, and like I've had Randall Kuna, who's the substrate independent minds guy come and speak at conferences in Melbourne that I organised about this very specific topic which I, I think it's quite interesting. Instead of trying to adapt like uh, the environment in outer space to suit biological humans in our now, it's more likely that we're going to adapt ourselves to suit the, um, yeah. the environment out there as well. Yeah.
Yeah. yeah this, this whole yeah, Star yeah. Trek sort of a uh, um, you know Star Wars idea where everybody's flying around in tin cans basically, with um, nice <laughs> environmental suits around them and everything, surviving. You know, it, there's a big sort of wall between them and the vacuum, which is going to be pretty difficult in the long run to maintain, especially when trying to go from galaxy to galaxy. Imagine, you know, in a, like a trip to Andromeda. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, I, I want to, in, on this point, and then I, I do need to go, but on this point, um, one person you might want to interview who's got a new book coming out, uh, it's a kind of an anthology. I'm, I'm in the book, but, the, but this person is the mastermind behind it. It's called The Star Arc. The Star oh, Arc. The Star Arc. Okay? okay. Yeah. yeah, and it's about the idea of, of being able to uh, present, uh, to create a spacecraft that would be very large, okay, very large, but would be able to, it would be kind of like a Noah's Ark kind of idea. Uh, but it would be floating in space, it would, it would be energy self-sufficient, so it would recycle all of its own energy, and, and would be able to float around the, you know, the galaxies forever, um, but it would be carrying within it, as its base composition, humans and, and, and various other species, including in DNA form and so forth. And so the book is basically about people imagining what that kind of habitat would be like, and it addresses issues that you were mentioning about how we would have to redesign ourselves in order to be able to create a kind of, you know, free-floating, permanent ecosystem. Yeah. Um, and, and so, so the person behind the thing, if it, if, if, if it should, isn't meant to be like a catalog of like what life there is something like that, yeah, it's meant to be something else. Well, or it, something beyond. Well, well, what it is, it, you've got different people contributing aspects of the story. So the chemistry, the uh, the biology of it. You know, imagining that there's going to be, you know, this is going to evolve in itself, right, over time in this kind of vehicle. Um, and so specifications of the vehicle. This is an outgrowth, by the way, of, of this thing called Icarus Interstellar, which is a bunch of architects and, and, and engineers who are actually trying to design spacecraft for this purpose that would be able to leave Earth on in 2100. And, and so various Silicon Valley guys... Uh, maybe even Elon Musk, uh, DARPA, all these various NASA, they've all put some money into this. And so this book is, is in a way, an outgrowth of that. It's called The Star Arc. It's, it's published by Springer Praxis, and the lead editor is Rachel Armstrong. Oh, yeah. Rachel Armstrong. You've heard of her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she used to be a science fiction writer. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah okay. okay. And, and she's now professor of experimental architecture at Newcastle University in Britain. Mm -hmm. uh, and you should interview her about this book. Okay. Because uh, this, is, this is a good topic. This is a good topic. And the book is coming out uh, this month. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. Well, yeah, I'll be yeah. sure to contact her about that. Uh, you'd be sure to put in a good word for me. And, uh, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to uh, give her some time on my show for sure. It sounds like a very interesting yeah, yeah. project. Yeah, yeah. I'll send you, I don't know if you have your email, I'll send you your email address if you don't have it, okay? Yes, yeah, that would be ideal. Okay. Oh, well, viewers, look forward to an interview with Rachel Armstrong. Hopefully it happens. <laughs> oh, it'll happen. It'll cool. happen. Cool. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll put the, the links to um, the the future book, Homo Deus, in the description. Yes. And um, also uh, Steve Fuller's review, and I'll be posting this um, as an article on my blog, scifuture.org. And yes, thanks for tuning in, subscribe to my channel, and thank you so much, Steve. It's been an enlightening conversation thank once again. Well, thank you, Adam, for having me. And